it's a great pleasure to be here. It always is to come to Moundsville and visit the congregation here, and especially uh, to be associated in some small way with the School of Preaching and the wonderful work that's being done through that effort. Uh, I didn't, I, at least I don't think I mentioned to Brother Denver that we're, the Matheny family is expecting to multiply again about March, uh, March the 12th. So that has affected our work in India a little bit more, even as uh, our adopting of our first uh, son has been. And lest anyone says, well, now I told you, you know, you adopt, you adopt a baby and there it happens, you're going to conceive. You know, I don't buy that at all. So you, can't hardly, you can't hardly convince me of that, but I guess that it, it kind of looks that way on the surface. But, but we're happy, and uh, whatever, whatever price we have to pay for that is worth it. Uh, Pam is uh, uh, in good health so far, and uh, uh, she elected not to come with me this trip because she's just getting over a month bout with uh, bronchitis. Uh, so it's been really difficult for her there. But uh, she sends her greetings, as do the brethren at Washington Street in St. Albans, and also our beloved brothers and sisters in Christ in India. Now, before I get to the text of my lesson, I had to run out to the car. Is Steve Higginbottom in here? There, he's back here somewhere. I don't know. He's not here, but this is for him. I had to run out to the car and get it. I think he speaks next, so I'll leave it up here. Ken sent it up and said for me to uh, pass it on to him. Uh, so I've, I've done my duty. Here it is. And, I guess maybe I've done you a bit of a disservice because you don't know what's inside it, but lest I embarrass Steve and, and his family, I'll just say that uh, when he was with us during the Greater Kanawha Valley Lectures, it was something that was tied very tightly around his neck during part of the time that he was down there, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Hinduism is something that I have grown to have more of an interest in as the years have gone by, and it has been prompted by the work that I've been involved in in the, the great nation of India. Hinduism, you may wonder why it would be under the heading that has been assigned to me, the influence of Eastern religions. And hopefully as we go through this and the lesson that I'll be delivering tomorrow at 10 o'clock, you'll be able to see why I decided to start out with this particular study. And I hope that it's not too dry and uh, technical and detailed for you because I believe that it is very important. Uh, the major, the primarily local, and I'll explain that to you in just a moment, religion of the Indian subcontinent is Hinduism. Ninety percent of all the world's Hindus live in the subcontinent of India. That means that there are roughly some 762 million Hindus living in the subcontinent, which primarily composed of India but also includes Pakistan in Nepal. There's a, a significant contribution to that population as well in the nation of Nepal, which up until about two years ago was a Hindu rashtra, or a Hindu state where Hinduism was a state religion and a protected religion. There's an element of the Hindu faith in India, small element, but a very wealthy and powerful element that wants Hinduism to become the official state language of the nation or uh, religion of the nation of India as well. They're calling for a Hindu Rashtra uh, also over there. So 762 million people, by and large, is not an insignificant number of people. And that size of a group cannot help but have some influence upon the world in which they live. When you look at our country especially, there's hardly one of us who has not come into contact with someone who has come from India. They're everywhere, and many, many times we find them in uh, industries, in occupations, in professions that are very respectable in the community. We have doctors, we have lawyers, we have physicists, we have uh, professors in colleges. Uh, many uh, uh, people in the academic world are of an Indian origin. Now, a number of those are from the Sikh religion, some are from the Muslim religion, but a lot of those are from the Hindu religion as well. So you can't help but look at a picture like that and conclude from it that some influence is going to be exerted upon whatever culture they happen to find themselves in. Now, in my mind, one of the greatest dangers of Hinduism and the philosophies, the intended philosophy, the intended philosophies of that religion is not that it is an overt attack 
on Christianity or any other religion because it is not. And in my mind, that's one of the greatest danger, dangers. It is a more subtle influence. In other words, if you were to ask people what they fear the most, Islam or Hinduism, perhaps for some of the reasons that Brother uh, Brantley has already uh, elaborated upon, most people probably say they fear the most Islam. Why? Because it's more visible. It's more obvious. We see those uh, bearded characters with dark circles under their eyes on television. Not the, I guess, you know, maybe I'm pointing at me when I say that. But we see those things and people fear the onslaught of, of Islam and the, uh, the militant attitude of many of those people. And I would have to echo what he said. That does not characterize all of Islam. But we don't see that so much with Hinduism because Hinduism doesn't present itself in that way. Hinduism and its attendant philosophies are just that. They are philosophies that characterize a way of life. They are not militant, but they do spread because of the nature of the philosophies. A Hindu is a Hindu with respect to his vocation, with respect to his recreation, with respect to every moment of the life that he lives, and he carries that with him everywhere that he goes. So we began to see the influence uh, uh, presenting itself unexpectedly in many different places, and, and we'll hold most of that thought until we get to our lesson tomorrow. Uh, the word Hindu is from a Sanskrit word, which was an ancient Aryan language, which means dwellers by the Indus River. Uh, that's one of the major rivers in what is now known as the country of Pakistan, which was divided from India when the British abdicated their authority uh, over India in 1947, or just shortly after that, excuse me, when Pakistan became a, uh, a separate nation that was set aside for uh, the Muslims. But it started there. That's where the Aryan influence developed and the Persian influence at a little uh, later date. Hinduism claims to be the oldest religion in the world, and they say it dates back 3,000 years. Well, I'd like to suggest to you that that's just a bit inaccurate because Hinduism as it is known and practiced today is not that old. Now, some of the oldest documents from whence they get some of the information concerning their religion, the Vedas, date back to that period of time, some 3,000 years back. But in India, most Hindus will readily admit that pure Vedism, which is not necessarily called Hinduism, is rarely practiced. So Hinduism as it is known and as it is seen today is not that Vedic religion that many of them would like for us to believe that it is. Uh, there are significant minorities of Hindus as well in Pakistan, as I've mentioned, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, which was also, which was formerly known as uh, Burma, South Africa, Trinidad, Europe, and in the United States of America. So we have to learn to deal well with the philosophies, the teachings, the principles that religions such as this present to us. And if you haven't dealt with them yet, you're going to have to, because the influence continues to spread in a multitude of different ways. You may not see a temple raised up to Shiva in your hometown. But in one way or the other, you're going to have to deal with the philosophies, the influence that present themselves in the academic world, uh, the technical world, the entertainment industry, in so many different ways. Hinduism is a difficult religion to define. <clears throat> I have sometimes been called upon to give a definition of exactly what Hinduism is. You know, if you can identify something, then you can fabricate a battle plan to, to confront it. But Hinduism, by its very nature, is extremely difficult to confine because it is very inconsistent. And I've heard it said, and, I, and I've repeated it uh, from time to time, that really the only thing that's consistent about Hinduism as a body is its inconsistency. It is consistently inconsistent. So it's very difficult to divine, define a religion that presents itself such as that. It has not one single founder. There is no one single founder of Hinduism. As a matter of fact, the different branches of the multitude of philosophies within Hinduism trace themselves back to a variety of different people at a variety of different times. The origin of Hinduism has been lost in antiquity. No one knows just exactly when, at what point in time, 
it started, what event uh, provided the catalyst for the development of it is just simply lost in antiquity. Uh, we just don't know. Another thing that makes Hinduism very difficult to define is that it has not just one holy book, such as Christianity and the Bible, <coughs> which is essentially 66 books for Islam and the Quran. Hinduism bases itself upon a multitude of different books and books about books. And <clears throat> so when we would call them commentaries, uh, but they see them as equally inspired with, uh, with the Vedas. Uh, there's no single unifying underlying doctrine. There's great diversity in belief and practices. Uh, not all Hindus believe in reincarnation, although most do. Not all Hindus are vegetarians. So there's really not one single unifying doctrine <clears throat> to tie it, all, uh, tie it all together. Hinduism accommodates <clears throat> a great variety of sects, cults, theologies, and philosophies. Uh, there is conflict, uh, there is competition in, on an intercaste type basis, but for the most part, persecution over heresy is a very rare thing. In other words, what this can be boiled down to mean is you're free to believe and practice essentially what you want to believe and practice as long as you don't step on your neighbor's toes. So that's something that we've begun hearing from different quarters today uh, from religions that are not founded or rooted in Hinduism. Uh, Hinduism is polytheistic, <clears throat> but generally views all gods as aspects of the absolute but unknowable Brahman. So the primary god of Hinduism, Brahman, not to be confused with uh, Brahma or Brahmin, uh, is unknowable. Uh, he is inconceivable. He is not understandable. And he is consequently uh, indefinable. So Hinduism as, as a, a, a theology and a philosophy of life is very multifaceted. Uh, you can travel as Skip and Keith Ball, Skip Andrews and Keith and others uh, who, know, who have gone to India, you can travel from one end of a village to another and find a completely different practice uh, or set of beliefs with respect to Hinduism. You'll find different gods that are uh, adored or honored or worshipped. It's just a very, very difficult thing uh, to cope with. But we're going to try to lay down some things that are fairly consistent among some of the sects and factions of Hinduism in order to try to help us get a bit of an understanding of that religion and why it is such a dangerous uh, religion uh, to those of us who would present and promote uh, the teachings of Jesus Christ as expressed in the New Testament. Hinduism is syncretistic. Now, when you look at these definitions and, and as you study these things, it kind of makes your skin crawl because you hear some of these similar statements being made by people today. Okay, now you listen to what I'm talking about here. What does it mean to be syncretistic? It's an attempted reconciliation or union of different or opposing principles. Where have you heard that before? Okay. It's an attempted reconciliation or union of different opposing principles, practices, or parties, as in philosophy or religion. In other words, you can have unity and diversity. It doesn't matter that you contradict, that you conflict, that you disagree uh, in the basics of philosophy and theology. You can still be unified. And Hinduism probably has done a better job at doing that than some other religions have tried, especially in that ecumenical sense that you and I hear so much about today. Hinduism assumes that all religions leads to God. There are just various pathways, different directions, uh, roads that one may take that all end in the same place. We give you a quote that I have by J. Parta, Parasarati. He's a Hindu, lives in Bradford, England. He's involved with the Interfaith Center there and frequently visits schools and lectures at universities. And he put it pretty well, this philosophy of, of uh, this syncretistic philosophy of Hinduism. One great dictum in Hinduism is there is every possibility that the other man could be right. Well, if you stop there, that's okay. I've got no problem with that. You know, I've been wrong more than once, and the person that I've been in discussion with has oftentimes proved to be right. But go one further and listen to what he says. We can think I am right, all right. We have every right to think I am right. But at the same time, the same way I allow my righteousness, my view is so good, the other man thinks the same way, so we must give a chance to others. We must think maybe the other man is also equally right. Where have you had that, heard that before? Yeah. 
So that's why I'm saying these philosophies are philosophies that we have to deal with. In other words, it doesn't matter that you and I may disagree completely, that our views may be entirely in opposition, completely incompatible with one another. Their concept of truth, their concept of what is right and what is wrong, allows that we may be completely in opposition to one another but still be equally right. Now, you see where that leads you? You just get into a very, very difficult time in understanding or accepting that there is any standard of truth that is concrete, that is objective, that is unchangeable, and that essentially is rejected by, by Hinduism. Consequently, Hinduism has assimilated much from other religions and is perpetually evolving. It's in a constant state of flux and a constant state of change. Every religion that has contacted Hinduism, including Christianity, including Islam, a multitude of others, Hinduism has assimilated or absorbed portions of those religions. So you're going to see little elements of a multitude of different religions in the various facets and sects and philosophies of Hinduism. It's just like a sponge that soaks in a mixture of different things. It's just a fascinating uh, process to examine. Uh, started out with what's called the mature Harappan culture that was a developed civilization of the Indi Indus River Valley uh, between 2300 and 1500 B.C. It seems to have had its own religion, although perhaps even then it was not completely uniform. <clears throat> then that area was invaded by the Aryans, who were ethnic kin of the Medes and Persians around 1500 B.C., and new forms of religions began to be introduced. Now here's where we have the beginnings of what later developed to what we know as Hinduism. The Aryan contribution to the peoples of that area included the Indo-European language from which Hindi evolved. Of course, Sanskrit was the primary language of, uh, of the Aryans who uh, invaded that, uh, that portion of the geography, but later it developed into Hindi, uh, which is a, an Indo-European language. Many words, even in English, have roots that uh, can be traced back to uh, Hindi, Hindi words. They introduced the Sanskrit writing system, and many of the languages, the current languages in India today, are based to one degree or another upon that Sanskrit uh, writing system. And there are 845 recognized languages in India, but there were 1,600 languages and dialects. Many of those have roots somewhat tenuously, some more strong, uh, to, uh, to Sanskrit in that particular writing system. The Vedas, or as they would call it, the Vedas, which is a collection of hymns to various deities, was also a contribution of those Aryan invaders of the uh, Indus River Valley. And by the way, the Vedas was written uh, in the Sanskrit language. That remains the priestly language of the Brahmins in India, uh, the language of Sanskrit. And by the way, just a sort of a, a, a footnote to that, most Indians, Hindus, don't understand Sanskrit. And this is one of the reasons it took me a few years to figure this out, they're traveling over there, that they have, some of them have an interest in hearing the gospel because we present to them a religion that has been translated into their native languages, such as Telugu in Andhra, where they've been listening to the priestly language of the Hindu priest Sanskrit, which they did not understand for the most part. We present to them a religion that's written in a language they can understand. And it's not some lofty, uh, intellectual religion that doesn't relate to their lives. Jesus talks about farmers and planters and plowers and fishermen and builders and carpenters, and that relates to them. And they have an interest in things like that. So that's just a footnote to, uh, uh, to the Vedas and the Sanskrit <coughs> language. Uh, the hymns are composed primarily uh, to honor Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the sustainer and the preserver, <clears throat> and Shiva, who is the destroyer. These are the three main gods of Vedic religion, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. As a matter of fact, they call it the Godhead. Uh, it is exactly what they call those three. And the similarities between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are not all that, uh, are, are, are all, not all that important. There are very few similarities there. Aryan worship. <clears throat> Aryan worship was a household type of religion, uh, similar to patriarchal uh, dispensation. 
Uh, there was veneration of ancestors. It was polytheistic. There were mostly male gods. There were no images or idols associated with Vedic religion. Ritual sacrifices of animals accompanied by hymns, incantations, and sacrificial formulas are recorded in the Vedas. Uh, some of you perhaps get pul pulpit helps. Now, I don't get that newspaper. Do you have a copy of that here, Emmanuel? Pulpit helps? Do you all get that? There was an article in that recently that a friend of mine sent to me uh, about the Vedas. It was an entire page, and I wish I had thought to bring that with me. Uh, it was based upon a supposed prophecy in the Vedas concerning Christ and the incarnation of, of, uh, of Jesus, who would be born in a stable and who would be sacrificed, who would be the Savior of the world. If any of you do see that, don't, don't buy it. Because I, I had seen that argument before. I had done some research on it previously. I wish I'd done a little bit more for your benefit now. But that particular part of the Vedas that is interpreted to refer uh, to Jesus is questionable as to its uh, being authentic, for one thing. And then number two, I would question it as to whether or not it is truly prophecy or something that was just repeated from something that they had heard uh, presented perhaps uh, from uh, someone other than uh, of an Aryan or uh, a Hindu background. In other words, it's something that could have just been repeated and put there that, come, that originated from another source. But the article presented it as, as authoritative, that this was prophecy and it spoke of Jesus and and uh, I don't believe that we have to come to that uh, come to that conclusion whatsoever. Then there was the Macedonian in influence, uh, which was which which a very short influence, but during the period of time that it was there was quite strong and quite influential. Uh, 327 to 325 B.C., Alexander the Great invaded the Punjab, which was also in that same area, the Indus River Valley area, defeated several Indian rulers and then departed when his troops refused to cross the Bias River. Then there was the Islamic influence, which, which continues today, beginning in about the 8th century uh, A.D., although Islam in India was influenced more by Hinduism than Islam influenced Hinduism itself. You would think that there would have been a, more of an influence in the opposite direction. But Hinduism ended up influencing Islam much more than being influenced by it. Islam, and uh, that's uh, another little fascinating aspect of, of the flexibility uh, of, of Hinduism and that syncretistic uh, uh, assimilating uh, ability that it has to uh, change almost upon uh, demand. So <clears throat> then the Christian influence, and I use the term broadly, started coming perhaps as early as 52 AD, if tradition is right, but the Apostle Thomas uh, arrived on the west coast of India in 52 AD. Of course, you know the Bible doesn't teach that. Uh, a lot of Indians believe it. They think it's gospel, although it's not. Uh, it, it's possible. Cert certainly it is. It is uh, indeed uh, quite possible. Uh, but then Roman Catholicism developed as a result of Jesuit missionaries in the 16th century. Protestant missionaries have been successful among tribals and scheduled castes, the outcast people of India, beginning with uh, the Baptist, William Curie's arrival in 1793. So the Christian, or in, in the broad sense, uh, influence, dates back uh, quite a while, uh, ways as well. And then there was also Sikhism that developed as a result of an individual uh, by the name of Guru Nanak's uh, observance of Hinduism and Islam as they tried to fit together and he took what he assumed to be the best qualities of Islam and the best qualities of Hinduism and combined them into a new religion, which is called Sikhism. And the Sikhs are the ones that you see that wear the colorful turbans, the men do, uh, usually Singh, S-I-N-G-H, is a part of their name. And if you don't know what that means, it just means lion. And uh, for the women, usually the name Kwar, K-U-A-R, is a part of their name, which means princess. When they come to the United States, they may put those down as their surnames, but those are just simply designations that belong to all Sikh uh, individuals, and they may, may or may not have a surname. It may be their village, but normally it will be an initial that, that uh, uh, precedes uh, their name that is their surname. Uh, so Sikhism uh, originated as a hybrid of aspects of Hinduism and Islam in the early 16th century A.D. as well. Now we get down to some of the basic philosophies of Hinduism. The philosophy of sin. Now, this, this is where uh, there's a, a great difference between this philosophy and what the New Testament teaches and the Old Testament teaches about 
uh, about the essence, uh, the reality of sin. Hinduism assumes that the spark of the divine is in each human being, thus calling a sinner is not a rational thing to do. I have talked to uh, Hindu priests, I have spoken to Brahmins, and asked the question, what is sin? And oftentimes you get a chuckle or a laugh and say, what is sin? And they will throw the question back at you. you know, sin is nothing. To me, it's nothing. Anything that I do uh, is right. There's no wrong. So the, uh, the concept of sin to many Hindus is a non-concept uh, entirely. To some Hindus, sin is not real. And it cannot be viewed as something which condemns. As a result of that, consequently, there's no need seen for a savior. If there's no sin, there's no need for a savior. We run into an attendant problem in Islam with that, that, that's quite similar to that. Uh, if, if indeed we do what we do because Allah wills it, then you know what's the problem? We, we have no need for a savior. Uh, Jesus is not considered to be, uh, to be essential with respect to his uh, role as savior and propitiation you know, for our sins. Sin is subject to diverse interpretation among the cults and sects of Hinduism. It may be simply committing bad deeds. It may be violating one's own conscience, or it may be entirely non-existent. And we'll get back to the Bible's answer to that as we conclude our lesson today. But you see, part of the problem that you face when you deal with something as slippery as that. You know, you have, you have to look at what it is they're thinking and understand to the best degree that you can what they think and why they think what they think in order to find the right buttons to push uh, to persuade them, to convert them, uh, to convict them uh, with respect to uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, by the way, Sanskrit and uh, that ancient uh, Vedic uh, philosophy gave us the concept of zero. I don't know if you knew that or not. And uh, with all due respect, mathematically, the concept of zero, that concept that came from, uh, came from then. And with all due respect, we know that nothing comes from nothing. And since, in my estimation, that religion provides absolutely nothing, then it makes sense to me that nothing would come from it. You know? But the concept of zero uh, came from them. Then the doctrines of reincarnation and karma are doctrines that we hear quite a bit about, and I endeavor as best I can not to tread in uh, Brother Winford Claiborne's uh, lessons because uh, he's going to deal with New Age and some of the attendant philosophies there. But they have their root as well in Hinduism. <clears throat> reincarnation is a concept as well as karma. Neither were found in the practice of that religion until well after the development of the Upanishads, which are commentaries on the Vedas, which were written between 600 and 300 B.C. So reincarnation is not an essential part of the Vedic religion. It's something that resulted with respect to an interpretation of uh, the Vedas. Uh, reincarnation, by definition, the tra transmigration of souls is the belief that souls of the dead return to the earth in another former body, especially in a new human body. Although in Hinduism, it not, doesn't necessarily always work that way. If you lay up enough bad karma, you may come back as something subhuman, or you may come back as a leper, or you may come back as a, uh, a, a cripple, or something of that nature. So the, the, the idea of always reincarnating to a higher level is a distortion of our Western mentality where our hedonistic uh, search for something that's always better and always makes us feel good. The Hinduism itself doesn't teach that. That's another gross interpretation and distortion of, uh, of, of Western uh, people who are always looking for an easy way out. Uh, reincarnation doesn't necessarily mean coming back as something at a higher level. Uh, karma is behavior in the past that determines your faith in the present. In other words, what you are today has been determined by a previous life that you lived. And it's fatalistic in that sense. Oftentimes in India, as we travel about, we'll see little stands and stalls set up where people are selling this, that, or the other. And they're just sitting there in the shade enjoying the day, and they're not really doing anything to try to sell anything or, or drum up business or, or promote uh, interest or anything like that. And I got to questioning that. You know, these are poor people. Why aren't they promoting their products a little bit more than what they're doing? And it surprised me. The answer I got this is a number of years ago. Well, what will be, will be. If somebody's going to buy something, they're going to come to me. You know, if they're not going to